Hello students, in Unit 9, we're going to be focusing our attention on memory. Our selective attention, that is. <laughs> oh, gee. Uh, well, that's as good as it gets in AP Psych. Alright, so in 9.1 uh, specifically, we're going to be focusing on information processing and memory. How do we take everything from our environment, put it in our brain, and store it there to retrieve later? That's the focus for this unit. So before we uh, begin all the processes that are involved in memorization, first, what is memory? How do we define memory? Uh, memory is the persistence of learning over time through the storage and retrieval of information. Whether it's academic information, whether it's environmental information, tactile, sensory information, whatever. It is the storage and retrieval of information. It's also important to note that memory is not a... Uh, it is not a domain of the AP exam in and of itself. Memory is actually a subdivision of the larger perspective of cognitive psychology. So if you remember from the beginning of the year, cognitive psychology is the um, mental processes uh, that take place, uh, that, that directs uh, human behavior. All right, so thinking, understanding, contemplation, that's all a part of cognition. So memorization is involved in that as well. All right, so memory is really important. Uh, memory develops over time through life experience as we acquire uh, more information and we store more knowledge uh, that can be retrieved. Um, so, as we, so for example here, uh, earlier on in life, you might not know that a hot stove is hot, and so when you touch it, uh, you're obviously going to be burned. And so this uh, new experience contributes to stored information which will enable you later on to maybe start cooking in a cooking class as a teenager and then when you're older and an adult you feel so comfortable with your uh, learned stored knowledge of, uh, of the kitchen that hey you feel comfortable taking a nap maybe uh, this is obviously an extreme example <clears throat> all right all right, so as we can tell from the last slide, um, memory is not just a passive process. Memorizing information takes effort, all right? It takes repetition uh, of, of that information. However, other memories are very, very easily uh, stored in our brain because of their significance to us. So it's important to note that the two the two most efficient ways of memorizing is one, repetition, as we saw in the last slide, and then two, is making something meaningful. When something is meaningful, which makes it easier to memorize, we call these memories flashbulb memories. And this is a clear memory of an emotionally significant moment or event. So, for example, for me, memories that did not, did not require me to repeat them, to memorize them, because they're so emotionally meaningful, are the birth of my son, when I got married, or when our ultimate Frisbee team won the state title the last two years in a row. These are memories that I will never ever forget, and these are memories that are gonna be very easily easy for me to retrieve later on because of their emotional significance to me. So as we can see, some information requires constant repetition uh, in order for storage in the brain to take place, whereas other information just requires sig uh, emotional significance for us to easily memorize it. So what, what uh, determines whether we easily memorize information or whether it takes more time and more, more effort to memorize something? This really shows us that memorizing is a very complex, intricate process. So now let's look at this process called information processing. So information processing, how do we encode information into the brain? All right, there are three steps to this process. The first step is encoding. This is where we encode information into the memory system. All right, so it's extracting meaning <clears throat> from a memory. So for example, when my son was born, I am encoding all that I'm experiencing. So the, the doctor sticking his hands into my wife's uh, belly and pulling out Emerson and Emerson crying. And I'm, I'm encoding all of that in. I'm encoding what I'm hearing. I'm encoding what I'm seeing. I'm encoding the emotions that I'm feeling as a result of this experience. That is what's being encoded. All right. So all the really meaningful parts of that is going to be then stored, which is the second process uh, of uh, memorization is this is the retention of the encoded information over time all right so most 
bits of information must be repeated to be stored. However, when it's emotionally significant, this storage uh, uh, step or phase is not as uh, effortful or does not require as much effort. Okay. So depending on our, on our emotional state, depending on how awake we are, depending on our arousal, all these things, that will impact how effective we are at memorizing information. And we're going to get more into detail with that later. And then the last step of how we, uh, how we memorize is retrieval. This is the process of retrieving that information in our memory that has been stored. All right, And we're going to talk about the neurological basis for this later. So we talked about the process of memorizing, encoding, storage, and retrieval. So now let's talk about what we encode, what we store, and what we retrieve, the different types of memory that exist. So the first and very, very brief memories that we experience are called sensory memories. Here. Sensory memories are the immediate initial recording of sensory information in the memory system and it contributes to our cognitive map, all right? So when you see lockers, when you uh, hear certain things, you immediately uh, try to encode them, all right? Iconic memory is sensory memory of visual stimuli, which lasts for only a few tenths of a second, whereas echoic memory is sensory memory that, of auditory stimuli that lasts three to four seconds. So echoic memory or auditory memory typically lasts longer than visual memory, all right? Um, now, if we are constantly stimulated by these senses, then the sensory memory is then transferred into short-term memory. And this is a memory that's activated uh, by a few items, and it's held briefly, uh, such as seven digits, give or take a few, of a phone number um, while dialing or before the information is forgotten. Uh, just short-term memory is what the bits of information that you hold in your memory for about an hour, okay? Um, so if, if, if a girl gives you her phone number, you just repeat it in your head until you write it down and then you forget it, that's short-term memory. And then long-term memory is the relatively permanent and limitless storehouse of the memory system. It's through repetition of short-term memory items that they're then transferred to long-term memory storage. All right, guys, here's a quick diorama or breakdown of the types of memory that we discussed on the previous slide. All right, so... I'm just going to talk about a few things in relation to this uh, diorama, and then we'll discuss it more in detail in class. All right? But as you can see here, uh, sensory memory, which again, like echoic memory or iconic memory, is very, very short memory. We're talking milliseconds to just a few seconds. All right? But as you can see, there's a large capacity for storage of the sensory memory. The reason that is is because as we've learned in sensations and perceptions and the biology of behavior with neuroscience, our brain is constantly being stimulated um, by our environment, by all the different senses that we process. We're constantly seeing different colors, shapes, movements. Um, we are constantly hearing different pitches, uh, different intensities, different uh, uh, volumes. We are experiencing different textures when we touch things uh, or feel things, different tastes, different smells. Our, our brain is constantly processing all these different sensory uh, information. So in order for our brain to uh, uh, function efficiently, we have to toss out most of this information relatively quickly. So that's why sensory information, while it does have a large capacity, it does not remain in the brain for very long. We're talking seconds here. All right, so what we pay attention to, what we focus our selective attention on, is what is typically transferred into short-term memory from the sensory memory. And through repetition, um, through meaningfulness, then short-term memory is transferred into long-term memory. Now, short-term memory has the most limited capacity. And we're going to talk about that more in detail next, whereas long-term memory is unlimited. However, recent studies have suggested that our long-term memory is not as unlimited as what we previously thought, and we'll go into de detail uh, with that later. So, you just saw a very brief image. Um, now, pause the video and try to think, what can you remember from that image? If you remember the bird, well, do you remember anything in the background? Do you remember seeing the small village or the mountain? Or do you remember the color? 
uh, of the background. If you can't remember certain things, well, that demonstrates the limits of your sensory memory and how little time that that information actually stays in your brain for sensory memory. Well, now let's talk about working memory. Working memory is a branch of short-term memory which involves active processing of incoming auditory and visual spatial information and of information retrieved from long-term memory. You associate new and old information to solve problems. So for example, let's say you're taking a multiple choice test. Okay, you read the question. Now you have to determine what is the question uh, um, uh, requiring you to do. So you memorize the parameters of the question and so, so that you can start to think about and start to retrieve from your long-term memory the answer to the question. So the parameters of the question are, are stored in your short-term memory so that you can then retrieve the answer or the information required from your long-term memory storage. So then you can answer the question correctly. Once you move on to the next question, that information from your short-term memory is, is completely released. It's, 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 it's gone from your brain so that you can move on to the next question, read the next question, and then memorize the parameters of that next question, short-term memory, then retrieve again the information from long-term memory so you can answer correctly. That's working memory involves comparing short-term immediate memories what's right there in your vicinity in your proximity comparing it to stored information from your brain long-term memory so that you can uh, make the appropriate decisions or appropriate actions all right well that will sum it up for 9.1 information processing we'll see you guys next time